Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren, and it is great to have all of you back along with us here with Word Awakening and the Sunday School Hour that we have recently started. Got a congregation here with us this morning, <clears throat> and I so thank the Lord for them, for my mother-in-law being with us. Of course, we've been praying for her the last uh, several months, and uh, she's finally got home here about a week ago, so thank the Lord for that, who is now with us as she continues to get well. <clears throat> and... Uh, and we'll give uh, we'll give announcements. Try to give these quickly, even though we do have uh, do have a few. Of course, I will be uh, here with a Sunday morning and Sunday night preaching. Uh, Sunday morning, tending to the Book of Psalms, and tonight we'll, we will begin a series about humility. And so we uh, thank the Lord for uh, thank the Lord for uh, leading us to do that. And then Tuesday, we are in Old Testament survey, and uh, going through the Old Testament survey, be in the Book of Leviticus. And Thursday, going through the Minor Prophets, currently in the Book of Amos. And it's quite nice to see how reminiscent that uh, North America is to the time to the times of the uh, to the times of the minor prophets. And then, of course, Friday uh, we will begin preaching in sign language. So we thank the Lord for that as well. We did a promo video about that yesterday morning. If you're not saw that, I highly encourage you to go watch that. My wife gave her testimony and a burden for deaf, blind, and special needs people. Of course, on that video on the, on the Friday night, on the Friday night, uh, preaching in sign language that will just be in sign language. And uh, no voice or anything there. And so we thank the Lord for that. And then also, yeah. And then also, of course, now just coming up, a one, two, three, four, it's about four weeks away now. We're going to have a, our Fall Ward Awakening Revival, be the third one that we've done. Uh, we will be going to October the 5th and through the 9th, October the 5th through the 9th. Now, on the 9th or on that Friday, we will be doing both. We will be preaching in sign language and voicing it. And uh, maybe we'll see how that goes. I will be able to preach in sign language and voice things at the same time. I know a lot of people who are very fluent in sign language can do both. I'm not quite there yet. I still need a bit more practice. Like if you watch that promo video, I was really slow. So I'm still expanding my vocabulary and everything. But so I'll pray for us there. And that's what we would just uh, continue to grow and expand our vocabulary with that. And look forward to the revival and everything that is coming up. And I thank the Lord also for providing for us. We got a couple of a couple of things that we can use whenever we start our church in uh, northern New York. As I said, my wife got a new karaoke machine. Like we were doing that, she was singing for us when we did our first revival all the way back in April. But throughout that revival, that actually uh, the karaoke machine we actually broke, unfortunately. But thank God, the Lord has provided us with a new one. We thank the Lord for the people who uh, who helped provide that, and also we have a uh, we have a new podium, a new podium that we might use for this sometime as well, uh, like for, for preaching on here, but one that we can also use whenever we go to Northern New York if we need a pulpit. And so we thank the Lord for providing for this ministry, and many of you out there who listen, uh, who uh, who help us, and so we thank the Lord for for that and for providing for us. And now we'll go ahead here and uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And then uh, we will get into the uh, the Sunday school uh, the Sunday school teaching that we have this morning. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the goodness of sin. Thank you for allowing us to meet again here through Word Awakening. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy, for your people that are helping a blessing to us. And we pray that you just continue to use us for your honor and for your glory. And just help us, we pray. Just do that mighty work in us, mighty work through us. Lead God and direct you that you have us to go, Lord. May Christ be your everything. May Christ be all in all. Just help us, we pray, Father, like only you can here this morning through the Sunday school hour and through the preaching. And uh, just uh, help hearts and souls, we pray. Help us grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. Help us in our doctrine. Help us to live holy and to uh, be of a help to people and do that work that you'd have us to do, Lord, that work that you've called us to do. Bless all uh, bless all the men of God preaching this morning, all those that stand in need. For it's in Christ's blessing, and we do pray. Amen and amen. And so last week, we gave the introduction here about being ecclesiastically separated. Uh, we, uh, we went through that, and if you're coming up upon... If you're coming up upon this video, I would I would encourage you to uh, to watch that one as well. And so, well, that was about about being ecclesiastically separated. Look at some things there, and as we said, we're going to be looking at some uh, some different things. We're going to look at some factions. Like the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of different factions, a couple of different sects within independent Baptists, and even though these people are King James only independent fundamental Baptists, we're going to look at how they are off how they are off in some things, off in a lot of things, and how we must separate from these people. I can be with my own personal conviction, uh, the group that we are looking looking at today, uh, over over through my life and through my young ministry, uh, I have uh, been in contact with these people and have actually tried to work with these people in fellowship with them, but I've not been able to because of my personal convictions. 
And this uh, recently happened to me yesterday, and my convictions were just screaming, so to speak, when I was around this individual. And uh, and uh, so, you know, I can't, uh, you know, I can't, I certainly cannot work with these people. Uh, and uh, so, and we will just look here at, uh, at how these people are are off in a, in a number of things and how they really should be marked and should be avoided. And, of course, the group that we're looking at this morning is going to be Ruckmanites. We're going to look at Ruckmanites next week. We're going to look at the, uh, we're probably going to look at the Easy Believist. And then, uh, and then, uh. And then in a, a week following that, weeks following that, I'm not sure exactly sure we are. They're going to look at Billy Graham and, and many of the many of the areas that he compromised, and how Billy Graham actually did much much harm uh, to the body of Christ as well. And then we're also going to look at like the charismatic Pentecostals, the tongues movements, and uh, some of these following weeks. Like I said, we don't know exactly what order the Lord is going to be with us, but this morning they're looking at the Ruckmanites. And uh, Ruckmanites are a faction within Fundamental Baptists. They follow Dr. Peter Ruckman, who lived from uh, November the 19th, 1921, to April 21st, 2016. So I uh, passed away there just a little more than four, four uh, years ago. He passed to the Bible Baptist Church and also operated the Bible Baptist Bookstore, both located in Pensacola, Florida. He is known for defending and promoting KJV onlyism. But we will see that he is uh, his extreme position on the King James Bible being advanced revelation, you know, thus being superior to the original Hebrew and Greek is an error. And also his multiple voices, his angry spirit and his other bizarre doctrines. You know, they're not only wrong, but they have done the church much harm. Uh, they've, uh, they've done a lot of harm uh, to the King James only stance and caused much confusion among independent fundamental Baptists. That's uh uh, that's really one of the worst things there, just about the, the type of reputation that Peter Ruckman had. You know, I, like I said, you know, I'm obviously a King James only independent fundamental Baptist, but, you know, you say that to a lot of people, you know, and a lot of people, you know, they immediately think of Peter Ruckman, you know, they, they think of a man that was married, you know, had, that was married three different times, a guy who had a very angry spirit, you know, was very ugly, you know, preaching behind the pulpit. You know, and about his extreme positions and his bizarre doctrines that we're going to look at here, you know, like, like some of it almost humorous. I mean, I guess you'd say sad humorous, like a guy that believed in UFOs and aliens and, you know, crazy things of that nature. So in this exposition, we're going to look at those, look at his dangerous teachings and, uh, and his followers, you know, explaining why they should be marked and avoided. And so Peter Ruckman, he teaches that the King James Bible is advanced revelation. And here are a few of his own statements declaring that the KJV is advanced revelation. These are only a few. Of course, you can uh, you can uh, go you can actually get that as a free ebook from Dr. David Cloud at WayOfLife.org. Uh, there's a free ebook there that you can get. Uh, a what about Ruckman? That's what it's called, and uh, much much of the information that we have here is in that book. Also, if you prefer hardback, uh, I prefer hard copy rather. You can get that as a paperback book for just five dollars. I think it is. And so I would highly, highly encourage you to check that out. But here are a few of his statements that the King James Bible is advanced revelation. He says, the AV 1611 reading here is superior to any Greek text. That's from uh, his book, The Christian Handbook of Manuscript Evidence. That was published by Pensacola Bible Press. It's called the Bible Press in 1970, and that's found on page 118. Then he also says from that same book on page 126, he says, mistakes in the AB 1611 are advanced revelation. And so there, that's obviously against the position we hold. We hold that the King James Bible is equal as it is. It is equal with the original Greek and Hebrew text. But Peter Ruckman says that there is a difference in the King James Bible and the Greek and Hebrew. But, you know, the King James Bible is advanced revelation. So, you know, that thus, you know, that is superior to the Greek and Hebrew I mean, that just doesn't sound right. And of course, we're going to look at how even biblically, you know, how the Bible even says, you know, that isn't right. And then also from, uh, this was actually found from the Bible Believers Bulletin in January 1994 on pages two and four. It says, if you are able to obtain a copy of Ruckman's proposed new book, you will have in your hands a minimum of 200 advanced revelations that come from the inerrant English text that were completely overlooked or ignored by every major Christian scholar since 90 AD. So, you know, that's quite a bold statement there, you know, saying that's been, you know, overlooked or ignored by every single theologian, every Bible scholar since 90 AD, all the way up until, you know, the 20th century, the 1900s, the later 1900s, when Peter Ruckman made this doctrine popular. 
But see, if Peter Ruckman is right, though, then where, where, where was the infallible Word of God prior to 1611? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, what did, what did Christians in that day and time use? And uh, what, what did churches do from the time of the apostles until the 17th century? You know, they didn't have the Bible. You know, what, what did they preach from? They didn't have the infallible Word of God. You know, what did those people do? You know, I mean, you know, that, that was even, you know, just, you know, really just before, you know, the refer you know, this was 1611. That was after, you know, that, that was even, you know, after, you know, the Great Reformation even began. So, you know, what did Christians do before Ruckman came and created this doctrine? Because if this doctrine is right, then, you know, why did no theologian or minister teach this doctrine before? You know, that was just an extremely, extremely arrogant statement. And that's one of Peter Ruckman's characteristics. You know, to say, you know, that this is a doctrine, you know, that's been overlooked or ignored by every major Christian scholar. You know, then why, why did, uh, you know, why, why did the great men of God of the Great Awakening revivals not receive and teach this doctrine? You know, you look at those Great Awakening revivals, you know, that we, we speak much of here. You know, the great men of God that they used. And, you know, these were men of God that, you know, that had lots of the power of God. You know, these were men of God that lived it. You know, most of these men of God lived before the invention of television. You know, they spent all their time reading, studying, you know, researching theology. You know, like Adam Clark, John Gill, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Matthew Henry, Matthew Poole, Charles Spurgeon, John Owen, Billy Sunday, Jonathan Edwards. None of these men taught this doctrine. None of these men taught it. You know, they, you know, as we said, you know, they studied the Bible several hours a day. You know, they wrote numerous books. You know, like a lot of these men that we've mentioned, you know, they wrote whole commentaries on the Bible. You know, but not a single one of them came to the position, you know, that Peter Ruckman held. You know, and if Peter Ruckman also, and this is another great error about that 1611, you know, pinning in on the 1611, the year 1611. If Ruckman is right and the Lord slammed the door of Revelation shut in 1611, and if the KJV was infallible and inerrant in 1611, why is the edition we use today revised? You'll see the edition that we use is actually revised. If you really look at some of you have as I have, like if you look at a 1611, a 1611, you know, was written in the old English, you know, like where they often had the letter E after a lot of things like old, like O-L-D-E. You know, like if King James Version was an error in 1611, then, you know, that would mean that even, you know, even the italics, the spelling and the punctuation was perfect, but it was modified. It was modified in thousands of places up until 1769. You know, the King James 1611 Bible, you know, has been modified. You know, it has been updated, you know, several times all the way up until 1769. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, like 100 and 160, you know, more than 160 years. You know, almost 160 years, you know, after 1611, the King James Version that we have, you know, was modified and updated. As we said, you know, there was updated spelling of the Old English, updated conjunctions, and an expansion of the use of italics. You know, here are just of the few changes, like there are a lot more, like you can read uh, David Cloud's book, What About Ruckman? He has even more. But for example, like in First, First Samuel 16, 12, requite good was changed to requite me good. And Esther 1, 8, for the king was changed to for so the king. And then in Nahum 3, 17, it was changed from the crown to thy crown. So if the 1611 was an errant and infallible, then Ruckmanites need to explain why we don't use the 1611 edition anymore. You know, and he also claims that the King James Bible was given by inspiration of God. He says that in the book, The Christian Handbook of Biblical Scholarship, pages 271 and 272. See, and this confuses the biblical process of inspiration. See, the Bible lays that out. The Bible lays out the process of inspiration. You know, whereby the scriptures were given through holy men of old with preservation. The process God has used to keep the scriptures since their original inspiration, like 2 Timothy 3.16. And see, and, you know, these are verses that if you really hold to the Ruckmanite position, you know, you're actually going to have to discredit, you know, what the Bible says here. You know, these, you know, supposedly strong Bible defenders, Bible promoters, you know, what are you going to do with 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the Apostle Paul writing back to Timothy in the Greek language, you know, originally. You know, and then the process of inspiration, that's further described in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. See, and these are texts, you know, that you can use for, 
you know, people who don't believe the King James is inspired, you know, who are more of the newly evangelical liberal position. But, you know, we also use this to, you know, to show why the Bible is inspired and it has, it has been preserved through the ages. First Peter 1, 20 and 21. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him to believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So here, the Bible, we are seeing here that the word of God, the Bible, it is perfectly, has been perfectly, perfectly inspired those times ago. I'm sorry, that was Second Peter. I thought that was wrong. That was Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that there just lays it out. You know, the Bible was originally inspired in the original languages. People in Greek, you know, there is no private interpretation. The Bible was there. And it was there all the many years ago. And it's still here today. See, these passages say nothing about, about, about inspiring, about copying. These passages say nothing about copying scripture text or making translations of the Bible. You know, and that's just where Ruckmites are so, so off. You know, these, these scriptures here, they don't say anything about copying scripture or making translations of the Bible to another language. You know, it's just there. The Bible was inspired. And the original languages to, you know, as we said, to accept Ruckman's position is to discredit these Bible verses when they're just there, plain and simple. See, it is the doctrine of preservation that guarantees that God would watch over the divinely inspired scriptures to preserve it to future generations. See, we do have the Bible today. We've got the King James Bible, the perfectly inspired, inerrant word of God, Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, seven being the number of completion. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, and serve them from this generation forever. Forever they're going to be preserved. Of course, English, you know, that's the language most people use now. And that is why the Bible has been preserved in the English language. Psalm 105. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. See, you know, and you know, like I said, on the same token, you know, people that say, oh, we no longer have the preserved word of God now, you know, that, that discredits these verses. You know, if God is God enough to inspire his word, then he's certainly God enough to preserve it to lasting generations. Matthew 5.18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. See, that's Jesus Christ speaking. He said the word of God is going to be preserved throughout. And thank God we have. We have had the preserved word of God. All the way from that original writing all the way up until now. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That we don't have the word of God anymore. The originals don't exist anymore. We've got that in the King James Version, the preserved word of God. See, the doctrine of preservation is clearly taught in these verses. Inspiration and preservation. Those are two things that go together when it comes to the word of God. The King James Bible has been given to us, but preservation. And it is an, it is an accurate translation of the original Hebrew and Greek. See, Ruckmanites teach that we don't need to study biblical languages such as Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. But, you know, I personally study these, Bible, these biblical languages, and I have gleaned and learned much. Learned a lot of things by looking up English words in these languages. Like, I have, you know, one of those Hebrew, Greek, KJV study Bibles that a friend of mine gave to me. You know, it's a great help, a great blessing. You know, I use it a lot. There's a lot that we can learn, you know, by, uh, by, you know, by looking up, you know, English words in biblical languages. 
See, and Peter Rockman, he's also wrong on it with his views on divorce and remarriage. He's been divorced twice and married three times, yet he has been a pastor all along. He defends his unscriptural, his unscriptural uh, mar marital status and mocks those who challenge his position. Like uh, his first marriage was before his conversion, and it ended in 1962 when his wife left him and filed for divorce. He began pastoring the Brent Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida soon after that. 1972, Peter Ruckman married the divorced wife of one of his former students. Then when a vote was taken in Brent Baptist Church as to whether the congregation supported his second marriage, 200 people voted for it, but 100 people opposed it. Then he, uh, he resigned and he started the Bible Baptist Church in Pensacola in, in Florida in 1974 with 17 people. Then in 1988, Peter Ruckman's second marriage ended when his wife walked out and sued for divorce. Then uh, Peter Ruckman's third marriage to a member of his church, a mother of three. Seeing divorces, they don't take place in a vacuum. You know, thank God I have parents who are who are currently married, although my dad, my dad was uh, was married to another lady before he married my mom. And if you've been around that, you know, divorces don't take place in a vacuum. You know, they take place in an environment filled with anger, carnality, hostility, bitterness, and sin. You know, that, that's not being judgmental. You know, that's just a fact. You know, I, I've never... You know, I've never seen any two people get divorced, you know, with a smile on their face, you know, kids with a smile on their face, everybody happy, you know, like, like, you know, like the lot, most, most, you know, the great majority of divorced people, you know, even, they even confess, you know, this, you know, you know, divorces, they don't take place, you know, when, you know, in a good environment, they take place in an environment filled with anger, hostility and arguing and everything, you know, and even Peter Ruckman, you know, describes his family life in days gone by as this, he says, I have had two wives desert me after 15 years of marriage. I have been in court custody cases where seven children's futures were held in the balance. In situations where gospel articles were being torn out of typewriters, biblical artwork torn off the easels, women trying to throw themselves out of cars at 50 miles per hour, mailing wedding rings back in the middle of revival services, cutting their wrist. Threatening to leave if I did not give my church to their kinfolk. Deacons threatening to burn down my house and beat me up. Children in split custody between two domicles, domiciles 200 miles apart and knock down drag out arguments in the home, sometimes running as long as three days. Saying, you know, this is what, you know, Peter Ruckman admits, you know, took place. And that's only a small glimpse, no doubt, into the sin and confusion surrounding those years. And see a man with that type of family life, you know, is simply not qualified to be in the pastorate. And we'll look at, uh, you know, we're going to look at that now. We'll look at, uh, you know, we'll look at the Bible holding that as our authority, of course. You know, what the Bible says, you know, about divorced, you know, about divorced and remarried preachers, divorced and remarried pastors. First, First Timothy chapter 3 verses, uh, uh, verses 2 and 4. Of course, there says a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. See, that first point there is blameless. That really sets the precedent for all of these qualifications for a pastor. You know, they, they, they are men that they are men who must be blameless. That means nobody can hold anything over your head at that, at that very next point. The husband of one wife. The husband of one wife. Because see, a man with that burden in his life just cannot be a pastor. A man who has gone through a divorce and been remarried. You know, like we, we looked at some of that there. You know, things that happen in a, in a divorce. You know, a man with that burden in his life, you know, that's gone through that. He simply is not qualified to be a pastor. Like look at verse 4. One that ruleth well his own house. See, and that's another big one. See, a man that's gone through a divorce, that's a man who didn't rule well in his own house. I'm not saying that divorced people are second class Christians, that they're not going to heaven. They can certainly be used of God in a great way, but the office of a pastor and the office of a deacon, you know, that is for men who have the right type of personal lives. And a man, you know, who has gone through like a divorce and a remarriage, that simply is a man who is not qualified you know, to pastor a church, you know, with that burden in his life, that is simply something that a man, you know, should not do. Like also Titus chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, 
having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. See, you know, that, that that's often things there that what happened, you know, like in divorces, you know, you have children and people, you know, who are rioting, who are unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not guilty, not not given to filthy lucre. And see, and those are often things that also take place, you know, when a divorce happens, you know, not self-willed, not too angry. You know, there's a lot of anger, you know, in the midst of a divorce, you know, no striker. You know, there's a lot of arguing, a lot of bickering, and a lot of things, you know, that take place, you know, when a divorce happens. And so people say, well, that says the husband of one wife, you know, but a man who's divorced and remarries, he don't have his first wife anymore, she's gone. Well, look at what the Bible says in a number of texts here, Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 6. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let, no, let not man put asunder. That's just that first voice. Two people have been joined together. You know, just getting a, just getting a, just getting a divorce paper is not going to change that. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 9. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And then also here, we'll look directly at this issue like of divorce in all Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 32. Matthew 5, 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, talking about divorce, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. See, that there is saying, you know, even, even a man, even a man, you know, who marries a lady, you know, who was divorced before, you know, he is still in the act of adultery, even if that is also his first wife. You know, and also in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 9, you know, Jesus says the same thing. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. See, a man of God in the pastorate, that's a man that has to, you know, be the example. That's a man who has to set the example of only having one wife, only being married one time, a man ruling well his own house. Because a man that divorces and remarries, he is in the act of adultery. Like Peter Ruckman, you know, he says, you know, he says men who are uh, men, you know, who think a divorced preacher is disqualified for the ministry. You know, he calls people like me self-righteous Pharisees. You know, this mocking ungodly attitude has encouraged other men to think that it's OK to be divorced and remain in the pastor and even flaunt the same before anyone who disagrees. You know, obviously, sadly, many, many people here have followed Peter Ruckman's lead. You know, really, what you know, before the time of Peter Ruckman, this is something that you really didn't find. You very, 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 very seldomly found, you know, among any Baptist before Peter Ruckman, especially fundamental Baptist. But, you know, this is one of his teachings, you know, that has caused this error, you know, in, the, in our churches with having men, you know, who have been divorced still in the pastorate. And then another thing that he's wrong on, men are saved in different ways. He claims that men are saved in different ways and different dispensations. He believes that men were saved by Christ's blood plus works in the Old Testament, that they will be saved by faith plus works in the tribulation, and that they will be saved by works alone in the millennium. Seeing millions and millions disappear, fact or fiction, the book Peter Ruckman says, if the Lord comes and you remain behind, then start working like a madman to get you to heaven. Because you're going to have to, you must keep the Ten Commandments. Keep the golden rule, give your money to the poor, get baptized, take up your cross and hold out. Uh, to the end of the tribulation, wait for Jesus Christ to show up at the Battle of Armageddon and be prepared to die for what you believe. In the tribulation, you cannot be saved by grace alone like you could before the rapture. Whenever Romans chapter 4 verses 1 to 8 plainly states that both Abraham before the law and David who were under the law were saved by faith without works. It says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath word of the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh 
is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. See, and this is the only plan of salvation that God has, has had, has ever had, and ever will have. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, based upon the blood, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament saints did not, the Old Testament saints, you know, they didn't know what, you know, what New Testament saints know. But Romans 4 makes it plain that the Old Testament saints, you know, they were saved by faith without works. Like Abraham, they believed God and it was counted, it was counted unto them for righteousness. Those who are saved in the coming tribulation will also be saved through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Like Revelation 7, 14 says, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, that I, right there, the Bible refutes that teaching that men are saved in different ways because it is always and always will be by faith. You know, even those saints who have not yet heard the gospel who will be saved during the, during the seven years of tribulation, they will be saved by faith not works. That simply is not biblical. And now here we're going to look also at his strange fleshly name calling. See, if you ever listen to Peter Ruckman preach, you know, like after hearing a lot about the man, you know, I've gone like on YouTube and saw some of his videos and, you know, he's a belligerent bully. He uses language that no Christian should use, especially not behind the pulpit. Like here are some things, you know, that, that he has called people behind the, you know, behind the pulpit by preaching or teaching. He call, he's called people jackass, poor, dumb, stupid, red legs, silly asses, apostolic succession of bloated egotists, two-bit junkies, two-faced, tin-horned punks, incredible idiots, egotistical jack legs, conservative asses whose brains have gone to sea, cheap two-bit punks, stupid little Bible-rejecting apostates. See, he can get pretty vulgar. You know, you know, you think this is the language that a preacher ought to use? Shouldn't use that anywhere, much less find a pulpit. See, in Peter Ruckman, he believes that God called him to speak like this. He said, God called me to sit at this typewriter and pour forth vinegar, acid, vitriol, and cleaning fluid on the leading conservative and fundamental scholars of 1900 through 1990. God is in charge. He destines me to sit at this typewriter and lambay, scald, and ridicule these Bible-rejecting fundamentalists who believe the Bible, who, uh, who believe the Bible is the Word of God. I hereby dedicate myself anew to the task of destructive criticism and negative blasting against every adversary of that holy book. Said that in the Bible Believer's Bulletin in December of 1985. See, in his spirit and language, that's not at all scriptural. He is fighting for a holy book in an unholy manner, and it is confusion. See there, see, doctrine. See, if you've got the wrong doctrine, often you're going to have the, the wrong lifestyle when you believe these bizarre, off-the-wall things that Peter Ruckman believes. You know, just like we mentioned, like about the easy believers with Jack Hiles and those who follow them. You know, like like we made mention of, like it's probably going to talk about that next week. Like about all the, you know, like all the people also among the Hiles, you know, this easy believers crowd who have committed adultery and been arrested for child molestation and all. But see, whenever you have an own doctrine, you know, that often, you know, that, that results in, the, in a wrong life.